Hello, my name is Simone Shires and I am excited to share my Accessibility Studies Capstone project, Deaf Accessibility, currently at the White River Amphitheater and future program recommendations. I'm currently a senior at Central Washington University and will be graduating at the end of spring quarter 2023 with a bachelor's in psychology and double minors in women, gender, sexuality studies and accessibility studies. While I was in high school, I started taking American Sign Language courses and continued them throughout my time at Central. My younger sister is the one who sparked my love of the, of the language and has been an, an inspiring factor in this project. One of my all-time uh, favorite hobbies and passions is going to concerts. I'm there for any type of music at any event, just having the best time connecting with people and with the music. And growing up in Western Washington, I was surrounded by live music constantly and often attended concerts multiple times a month. However, when trying to connect my two passions, ASL and concerts, I found that they seemed to be mutually exclusive and that when I attended concerts, I never saw any interpreters or interacted with anyone from the deaf community. Out of the hundreds of concerts I have been to, it seems impossible to me that I cannot think of one time where I saw someone using an assistive device or communicating using ASL. Now, this could just be my bad memory or the fact that I wasn't intentionally looking to see how people were interacting, but it struck me that there also didn't seem to be any overt attempts or promotions surrounding accessibility for the deaf community. Since I can't feasibly audit and analyze every venue in Washington, I decided to focus on a large popular venue that I had visited on multiple occasions so I would have a first-hand general understanding of the environment and what someone may need in order to fully participate and enjoy the show. This ultimately led me to centering my study on the White River Amphitheater in Auburn, Washington. Inspired by personal experiences and by groundbreaking programs and technological advancements, the aim for this study is to determine what current policies and accommodations are set in place for the deaf and hard of hearing communities at the White River Amphitheater and what steps can be taken to enhance their experience. According to the World Health Organization in 2019, 20% of the world population, which is estimated at over 1.5 billion people, live with hearing loss impairments. And about 5% of the world population, which is about 430 million people, experience disabling hearing loss. Hearing loss varies immensely, and so it makes sense that an individual's communication access needs should be individually accommodated. The main purpose of this study is to put a spotlight to the White River Amphitheater's extreme shortcomings in their accessibility and accommodations, their online presentation of their accessibility, and, the, and present recommendations aimed at improving and expanding the deaf community's participation abilities in accessible co accommodations. The White River Amphitheater, or WRA, as shown in the three pictures, is an outdoor concert venue that is laid out in a bowl design with a semicircle of theater seat seating cascading down the steep hill towards the stage that's located at the bottom. There's an additional seating area at the top of the hill in the lawn that does not have any coverage or assigned seats. Amphitheaters as a venue are classified by their rounded outdoor open buildings with rows of seats accommodating 5,000 to 30,000 people during warm weather seasons. There are about 150 amphitheaters in the U.S., but only three in Washington. WRA was built by the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe on the reservation in 2003 and was presented as a gift to music lovers. So far, they have hosted 175 again events. Regarding literature pertaining to hearing accessibilities and accommodations at large venues and concerts, there is surprisingly little information. The ADA is the laws and guidelines that protect people with disabilities and provide a minimum standard of accessibility that must be met for concerts held at amphitheaters and their attendees. ADA Title II and III are the referring guidelines. Title II provides deaf people with an, ass an assurance of being able to communicate and have an equal opportunity to participate and enjoy all of the benefits that everyone else would. In terms of communication, it dictates that the venue must provide appropriate and necessary aids and services to those who need them. Title III focuses and enforces that steps are taken by the venue and staff to ensure that people with disabilities are not being excluded, denied services, segregated, or otherwise treated any differently than those without disabilities. There have been some amazing technological advancements over the last few decades that have provided greater opportunities for everyone to be fully connected with music and have a completely immersive experience. Thanks to artists like Coldplay and Phineas, the Subpack is one of the most well-known devices. It is a small vest with sensors spread across the chest and back that vibrate along with the bass line or beat of, uh, beat of the music. There are many other devices that work similarly to the subpack, but in, may not be as promoted or as advanced in their testing stages. Sound shirts, which are a long sleeve shirt with specific, uh, that was specifically designed for live concerts, have 16 sensors spaced across the whole upper body that are wirelessly connected to a series of microphones placed around the stage that then trigger vibrations throughout the whole body in accordance with music. 
The haptic suit is an experimental design that creates a full sensory experience. A vest similar to the step act in style design and wrist sensors and belt all use transducers to amplify and translate pure audio into vibrations felt all over the body. The vest can then be paired with a visual light display system that allows the users to also experience the music visually as it presents music as shapes and patterns with different brightnesses and colors that can match and follow along with the song's current note, duration, pitch, loudness, timbre, and key changes. Thankfully, there are programs and events that intentionally go past the ADA minimums by building an event with an intentional universal design. The Oral Diversity Network is a program created by leading scholars that gives disabled artists and accessibility researchers the space to present, learn about, and interact with new advancements. While researching concerts, I found multiple guidebooks and toolkits that have been published and if used would create a vastly more inclusive environment. These publications have come from universities like Syracuse, organizations like the ADA themselves, as well as from companies built purely for uplifting and accommodating the disabled community. In the UK, the organization Attitude is Everything is a pillar example of an organization setting new standards for accessibility. Similar pro progress has been starting to be seen in the US, like in the Lincoln Center's annual Summer for the City event that celebrates diversity and unity. The study is founded in extensive research and literature review reviews, so I conducted a descriptive research design based on investigating the WRA and Live Nation's websites in order to identify their current practices and then compare it against established and progressive tools. When analyzing the websites, any relevant information, or lack thereof, was noted, as well as how the information was obtained and the level of difficulty in retrieving it. As the study was conducted purely through a solo online investigation and no human subjects were involved, HSRC approval was not necessary. To increase efficiency and organization, an original table was created. The tool's four distinct categories were presented as listing any assistive devices or accommodations that were available and steps needed to receive those services, what information was being promoted online relating to hearing accessibility, the level of difficulty it took to find information in the specific steps taken in this process, and lastly, listing any alternative or additional information found relating to other dis disabilities, both in place of the information I was seeking and in total to highlight the restricted perception of what accessibility accommodations means. For example, how many policies were expressed in regards to physical accessibility compared to hearing. Ultimately, I was surprised by my findings, but for the most unfortunate reasons. The only information I was able to find on either website was solely pertaining to accessible seating and parking. The contact number I was able to finally hunt down was on a Q&A page and was given as a tool for people who had questions about seating, parking, and scheduling and were using a screen reader software. Finally, there was absolutely no mention of any specific assistive devices, accessible accommodations, or services available. In summation, the WRA is, for all intents and purposes, inaccessible for the deaf and hard of hearing communities. The fact that no assistive technology was discussed implies that they are shockingly unequipped as many assistive devices require some sort of radio or infrared connection and may require staff assistance. If there are accommodation policies and services in place, then lack of promotion of this information leaves the target community unaware. Due to the lack of information, people in the deaf community are excluded and isolated from these social events and in the end are left either unable to attend events hosted at the WRA or to attend in a largely restricted and altered manner that may heavily influence their participation abilities and experience. In order to make the needed improvements, the WRA's inclusivity needs to, be monumental, needs to include monumental changes, but these would have a minimal impact on the overall experience of the general public. Starting with their online presentation, the venue should create an, accessible, an accessibility page that lists relevant information surrounding different types of disabilities, aids and services available, and contact information. Additionally, con concerts should be planned from the start with a universal design in mind. And last but not least, expanding on the accommodations they provide. This may look like staffing multiple ASL interpreters for all events and accumulating a variety of assistive devices that can be provided upon request depending on the person's needs. Communication access real-time translation, or CART, is not always feasible, but when accurate real-time captioning cannot be guaranteed on a big screen uh, or personal devices, having an event itinerary or, and corresponding lyrics or a script with this device. Reflecting on this study, there were multiple limitations. I was limited by distance as I lived two hours away from the venue by time period of this study, um, COVID restrictions, the financial cost of concerts, and the lack of concerts being hosted as the study was completed primarily in the winter. Due to these restrictions, there were many information, there may be information accommodations that are available in person or over the phone that I was not privy to. 
For future research, I would strongly suggest visiting events in person to verify all findings compared to online and re reaching out to the venue to get more specific answers relating to their policies. Going further, comparing accommodations and experiences between differing events and demographics. I will be reaching out to the WRA and potentially Live Nation with my research findings and suggestions and will hopefully get a dialogue going in an effort to improve matters. Aside from the study, my next steps include attending graduate school in order to earn my master's in mental health counseling, to become a licensed mental health counselor, and then hopefully work with kids and their families. I would like to give a special thanks to my ASP professor, Lynn Swedberg, and my ASP advisor, Naomi Jeffrey-Peterson, for all their guidance and assistance this past year. Thank you so much for listening.